Uh, we're going to look at this passage um, in three parts. Uh, the first thing we'll do is just try to find the main point. What's, what's it trying to say? And then we'll look at uh, two implications. So those will be both about the resurrection. So part one. Um, it's early in the morning. Mary gets up at dawn. She, she runs to the tomb. Uh, Mary Magdalene had a propensity for staying at things a long time and being there early. She was the last person with John to leave the crucifixion. She was there all the way till his body was taken down. The other disciples had fled. Um, she had hung around Jesus uh, for quite a number of years up to this point. Um, in Luke chapter 8, Jesus had exercised seven demons out of her. And uh, since then, she had been there. She had sat at his feet. She had heard his preaching. She had, she had heard all the times he rebuked the Pharisees. She, she was there. And here she is again. She comes to the scene and she goes back and she reports to the disciples, he's gone. They've taken his body. And we, I don't know where they put him. That's what she thought. And so we have Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. Probably John, probably the author of this gospel. He might not mention his name here because he, he sprint, they both sprint to the tomb and the disciple whom Jesus loved wins. And so maybe he was trying to prevent a, uh, some type of pride or something to well up. Uh, so he doesn't say his name, but it's probably John. They get to the tomb. They look in, and it says that John sees the cloth, and he believes. He believes. Uh, if you look at verse 9, the main point of the text couldn't be any clearer. John, John literally puts it in parentheses for us so that we'll see it. Uh, they still did not understand from the scripture, from the writings, that Jesus must rise from the dead. That's the main point. That's the point John, John's trying to get across to you. Now, what this brings up for us then is a question of why. Uh, if you look at the very next verse, the disciples go back to their homes, but Mary stands outside the tomb. Uh, the NIV says crying. Um, the sense of what she's doing there is not, it's not, it's not just crying. Um, it's much stronger than that. It's, it's weeping. It's gut Weeping, the kind of weeping that you do when, when somebody in your family dies or you're, you're 14 or 15 and, and some girl broke up with you or um, which don't, don't downplay, that's some, that's some serious sorrow um, or, or she gets cancer or he's got cancer or, or whatever. You know, you know what I'm talking about, you've been there. That's the kind of weeping that she's doing here. Um, and so the question is why? Why does Mary sit there weeping like that? Saying things like, they've taken his body. While John simply looks down into the tomb, sees the cloth, and believes. And so w what John's presenting for us is this antithesis between belief and unbelief. Uh, responses. It, it's a principle of antithesis. It's a principle between how you respond to the resurrection. Because the simple fact is, none of us saw Jesus rise from the dead. Right? You aren't there. You know, even the oldest among us are far removed from the day that Jesus rose from the dead. We haven't seen him. We haven't seen the resurrection. We haven't seen the tomb that was rolled away. And so what's going on here? Um, it, this problem isn't new. Uh, it's been around since day one. You remember that Matthew records that it was Satan's lie to spread, that Jesus' body had been stolen. Um, uh, Scotland is one of the great homes of the Enlightenment, the big movement that tried to make um, Christianity reasonable. Right? And so you've got figures um, in England and Scotland like John Locke and John Toland and David Hume famously here. And what they were trying to get at with that whole movement in the 17th, 18th century was that Christianity doesn't need all the supernatural stuff. Uh, you, can, you can throw all that out. We, we've got a decent religion if we just cut out the parts of Scripture that talk about supernatural things and we keep the ethic. 
you know, live well, love neighbor, that can form a good society. That's sufficient. And so this problem has been around for a long time, but it actually crept really deeply into churches and different theological circles um, throughout the 19th and especially the 20th century. And it came to a, a head in the middle of the 20th century. This guy from Germany named Rudolf Boltmann, this is what he said about the resurrection. The resurrection is something merely here and now. It's entering into a new dimension of existence. It's being set free from the past and from guilt and from, ca- and from the care of being made open to one's fellow man. So what Boltmann was saying is, look, we don't need the supernatural. We don't need a resurrection historically. All you need to have cr- the Christian religion is a, re- is a resurrection inside of you. An existential resurrection. A, a resurrection of your heart that says, I'm open anew to fellow man and to society and to love. Now look, we want to affirm that, right? I, I, I think that's true. I think we do need a resurrection inside of us. I, I think we do need to be made aware of um, our love for fellow man and all these things. But John's central point in this text is, without historical resurrection, there is no Christianity. That's the point he's trying to make. Uh, to say it to Boltmann, the resurrection is not merely something inside of ourselves. It's something that actually happened. And without it, we wouldn't have this religion. Now, uh, everybody needs to have a, um, uh, like a three-minute coffee shop napkin presentation for talking to somebody about the center of the Christian religion. What's it all about? And Paul puts it really clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what he says. I deliver to you that which is of first importance. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the writings or the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now if you look back at uh, verse 9 again, that's the same thing John says. He says, they did not understand from the scripture, or literally the writings that Jesus must rise from the dead. Now, what writings is John talking about? What writings is uh, Paul talking about in that passage? The New Testament hasn't been written yet. He's talking about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And so John's looking back and saying, look, we didn't understand at this point that the whole Bible, Genesis to Chronicles, all of that is all about Christ's resurrection. He's saying that this is the climax of all of history. This is what everything prior to and what everything after would be about. This is the center of history and the center of the Christian religion. And he nails it home a little while after that. Paul does it. He says this. If this is not a response to Boltmann, which you read, I don't know what is. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. And then he goes on later and says, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead... You are still in your sins. And so his point is this. Look, if we don't believe historical resurrection, if historical resurrection didn't happen, then there's absolutely no point in me standing right here. There's no point in this building existing. There's no point in any of it. It's futile. We're still guilty. We're still in our sins. All right, so that's that's the main point of the text. That's point one. Point two, let's look at the rest of the passage and flesh out this uh, division between Mary and John that we saw, belief and unbelief, this antithesis. Um, If you read the book of John much, you'll see that the book of John has a ton of misunderstanding in it. Um, If you think back, I think I've said this before here, uh, John chapter 3 is the really principal example of this. Nicodemus is talking to Jesus. Jesus says, You want to see heaven, you must be born again. And you remember what Nicodemus says? How am I to be born again? Must I climb back into my mother's womb? Um, He he doesn't get it, right? He doesn't understand what Jesus is saying. And you see that all throughout the book of John. The disciples don't get it. The Pharisees don't get it. And now here it's happening again. Mary doesn't get it. She's heard Jesus preaching. She's she's heard what what he said. He said things like, this, 
Just as Jonah went into the belly of the great fish for three days, so must I. He said that in front of her. And what was he saying? He was saying, I will go down just like Jonah. I will go under the water. I will die. And for three days, I will be under the earth. Tons of statements like that throughout the Gospels. And Mary doesn't see it. She doesn't get it. And so look with me, uh, starting in verse 12. The, the first thing that happens is she's weeping. She's bent over. She looks in the tomb. She's crying uncontrollably. uncontrollably and she sees two angels in white. Look, all of a sudden there are angels there. In the tomb. John's trying to say, wake up, reader. There's two angels there. It's all these clues to Mary. Wake up. Look and see. Remember. There's two angels sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where Jesus' body had been. And they ask her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Do you not see? Do you, do you not get it? Why, why would you be crying? This is the greatest day in history. Um, and, then it, and then it gets worse. She, she says, they've taken away my Lord. Uh, grave robbery was such a bad problem at this point in history that just a few years after this, the Emperor Claudius would pronounce grave robbery, grave robbery to be a capital offense by, to be, to be uh, dealt with by crucifixion. So... Um, so she's justified in her context. You know, we, we, can, we can go there with her and say, look, grave robbery. They've, they've taken him. Somebody's taken him. I don't know where they put him. It makes total sense. But then the passage takes a turn, and you don't, it's, it's like reading Shakespeare. You don't, you don't know whether it's humor or tragedy. Uh, it says this, at this, she turns around, and she sees Jesus standing there. But she doesn't realize that it was Jesus. And then if you look down one verse that says, what? That she thought he was the gardener. She thought he was the gardener. And so notice in verse 15 that Jesus repeats the exact same thing that the angels had said. Woman, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Whom is it that you are seeking? Who is it that you're looking for? Now, the reason I think this is actually a rebuke from Christ, he's actually rebuking her mildly here, is because this phrase, not only is whom are you, why are you crying repeated, but he says, who is it that you're looking for? Whom are you seeking? That phrase is re repeated five or six times throughout the book of John. And every single time, it's addressed towards unbelief. He says it to the Pharisees, he says it to the disciples. And then in John chapter 18, when he's praying in Gethsemane, and Judas brings uh, the, the Romans there to capture him, they say this, um, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and he asked them, who is it that you want? It, it, that, I don't know why they translated it differently, but it's the same phrase. Whom is it that you are seeking? And look at what he says. He says, um, he actually just says, I am. That's it. He just says uh, to them, I am. They say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. I am. And they fall down on their faces. Right? Why? But, because at the rebuke, when, when Jesus says, whom is it that you're seeking? They say, Jesus. And he says, I am. He, he's identifying himself with Exodus chapter 3, he's saying, I am Yahweh. I am the God of the Old Testament. I am the God that you've read about all your life. They fall down on their faces before him. You see, he, he's rebuking them for unbelief. And he says the same thing again here to Mary. Look, here's the point. It's impossible to believe the resurrection. We weren't there. Not even a woman that had seven demons removed from her by this very gardener could believe the resurrection. 
You didn't see it, and you can't believe it. Um, when, when Christ came and became the God-man, when the second person of the Trinity came and, and took on flesh and became like us in every way, what happened was is that all the sins for which he was to die were given to him. Uh, Paul says that he became sin. And so the reason Jesus was crucified was for sin, you see. He was crucified because he became sinful. Not because he did anything sinful, but because he became that way. We talk about imputation or something like that, that our sins were given to him. When Jesus, at this point, is resurrected from the dead, what is happening is that Jesus is actually being vindicated. What God is doing, God the Father is looking down and the triune God is raising Jesus, the second person from the dead and saying, the reason you are being raised is because you deserve it. He he earned it. Hebrews talks about him uh, paying full obedience to the Father. He had earned this resurrection. He had obeyed the law absolutely perfectly because we couldn't. Our sins were imputed to him, and he defeated them by obeying, you see. And so at this point, what Jesus has done is he has earned his own justification. He's being justified before the Father from sin, not from any sin he did, but from the sin he became, you see. Our sin. But the interesting thing is that what happens after that is that Paul explains in Romans 4.29 that Christ's resurrection is our justification. So so not only is Jesus justified at the resurrection, vindicated, pronounced to be this obedient son, but it's also our justification, this very event. Now, come back with me here and see what happens in this passage. With all that in mind, Mary says to Jesus, Sir, If you've carried him away, says to the gardener about Jesus. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. She thinks she's going to go find his body. That's what she's saying. In John chapter 10, uh, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. He was speaking to the disciples. Mary was there. And he says this. I am the good shepherd. My sheep... Hear my voice. And when I call out their name, they come to me. In John 20, in verse 16, when Mary looks at Jesus and says to his face, you're still dead, he says to her, Mary. He just calls out her name, you see. My sheep hear my voice. And when I call to them, they come to me. You see, what's what's going on here is for the first time in all of history, the very first moment, the very first person is having the power of the resurrection applied to their justification. All of a sudden, misunderstanding, gone. Unbelief, gone. The scales removed from her eyes. This man is no longer the gardener. This is the Christ. Resurrected in power. And it happens for no other reason than simply that he says her name, Mary. Now look, I would suspect that all of us, most of us could be, uh, could be termed in one of two ways um, with two problems. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian here tonight, one of those problems is the problem of self-sufficiency. Um, a lot of us, including me, we think of ourselves as very self-sufficient people. I heard an illustration this week from Tim Keller, who was preaching at my home church. And uh, he said this about self-sufficiency. Um, you know, when you're 15 years old, you, you look back at your 10-year-old self, right? And you think that guy was so dumb. You know, he was pathetic. He was, he was a dumb 10-year-old. And then when you hit 20... You look back on your 15-year-old self, right? And you say, I'm 20 now. Or I'm 21, maybe, in America. That's especially important. I'm 21. 
man, I was dumb when I was 15. I did some really dumb stuff, right? And then it starts to slow down a little bit, and then you hit 30, and you look back on your 20-year-old self, and you say, man, was I dumb when I was 20. And then maybe by the time you're 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, you finally realize, I still am. It's it's never going to change. I'm always going to look back on myself and think that all the things I didn't know, all the ways I was totally inadequate, all the ways I failed constantly, all the ways that sin that I could never beat was always over my head, right? We're still there and we're not getting past it. We're not sufficient. But, but then a lot of us struggle with the absolute opposite problem and that's we despise self-sufficiency or we're, we're so wired against self-sufficiency that we, we're, we're always walking around in absolute despair with no self-worth whatsoever, um, we don't think of ourselves as ever being good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And both of those problems actually lead to the same thing. One leads, leads to absolute doubt and despair that I can't be saved. I, I'm never going to be there. I'm never going to have it together to show up on Sunday nights or, or whatever. I mean, you're all here Sunday nights, so that probably doesn't apply to you. But... Um, but, but, the, but the other person, it, it leads to this, this confidence that, that you really live like you don't actually need any of this stuff. Um, pride and total lack of self-worth. And, and that's for Christians and non-Christians alike. We, we do that. And so what, what often comes about is we get into our Christian life and, and we just don't really care most of the time, right? Have you been there? You don't care about reading the Bible, like, you don't care about prayer. You, you, work trumps it, right? Every morning, work trumps it. And all these things, you, you don't care. But listen, if you think about what this text is saying, is, is this, both of those problems, self-sufficiency and a total debasement of self, both come from the fact of viewing this life and viewing your relationship with God as one of acceptance, of worth and acceptance. How, how am I going to be accepted? Am I good enough or, or, or not? And, and here's what Jesus is saying to us through this passage. You don't get accepted by God because of how many times you cry out to him or, or how many times you didn't cry out to him or how good or bad those cries happen to be how much worth was in that, how much you really meant it. But you get accepted because Jesus actually calls out to you. You don't call out to him. He calls out to you. He says your name, you see. You you have a God, like Derek was talking about this morning and last week, that is unchanging, transcendent, triune. He is creator. He made you. He made the mountains And he calls you by name. He says to you, Colin, come sit at my table. Right? He he says, Neil, come sit at my table. The the only reason we have an invitation to the feast is because he speaks our name. He he puts your place card down at your seat at at the wedding banquet. Look, this type, this is what we call the gospel. This type of gospel the power of the resurrection applied to you through the personal God speaking your personal name. That's a gospel that makes a whole lot of Jesus and not very much of us at all. Jesus is really big in this gospel and we're quite small. But the amazing thing is um, that this passage doesn't end there. It's a gospel that makes much of Christ, but um, it's also a gospel in a sense that makes much of us. So come back with me to the passage, and this is our third part, and we'll be brief and close here. The next thing Jesus says to her is, do not cling to me. Now, he, he says that because she gives him a bear hug, man. I mean, she, he says her name, she wakes up, she believes and, he cling, and she clings to him. Her arms are wrapped around him. And so uh, he says, don't cling to me. 
for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary Magdalene goes with the news and she says, I've seen the Lord. And she tells them. Um, just stick this passage into your mind. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, Moses writes about a feast in the Old Testament, um, uh, a harvest feast. And it's a sacrifice. And what you do is you bring the first fruits of your harvest to the temple, right, to be sacrificed to God, to be given to God. And, and what in, is entailed is that is you're trusting God and saying, look, everything that's given to me is a gift from you. But what it also entails is it's a promise from God saying, you give me your first harvest and I will give you a second harvest. I'll give you plenty. Okay. Now, when Jesus says, don't cling to me, I have not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He's giving this this language of solidarity there and saying, look, the things I have done, the resurrection, my life, my death, that has merited for you the ability for me to call you brother, sister. The father is now my God and your God. I'm going to our Father. That's what he says. I'm ascending to our Father. I mean, he says other things like this throughout the book of John. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Right? I I have to leave to go to our God. That's what he says. Now, remember this, this first fruits feast idea I just raised. In 1 Corinthians 15, the same passage we were looking at earlier, which is the quintessential passage on the resurrection from Paul, he says this, Christ has been raised from the dead, and not only that, he is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. And then he goes on and says, in Adam all have died, so in Christ all will be made alive, but in order. The first fruits first, and then when he comes, those who belong to Christ are the second fruits. Look, This is the point Paul's making. It's the same point Jesus is making to Mary. If you're a Christian tonight, if your eyes have been opened, if God has called you by name, everything that happens to Jesus is going to happen to you. You see? You're going to get this resurrection. It's going to be bodily. You are the second fruit. The Leviticus feast was all about this. It was all about this event. And it was all about you someday rising up from the dead bodily. There's none of this um, idea in the Christian religion that we're all going to be ephemeral, pie in the sky, float around with wings amongst the clouds. That's not heaven. What we were made for is our bodies with God dwelling with the God-man, hand in hand, in a garden. In a place where there's plenty of food and tons of water and it's beautiful and it's perfect and there's no tears and no death. That's what we see in Revelation 20. And that's what's going to happen in Christ. Look, we could say it this way and this will be the last thing. The resurrection historically is, is past, present, and future for all of us. It's already happened. It is happening to you right now if you're a believer in Christ. He's changing you. That's a resurrection. And it will happen again to your body. But your body aches tonight. It groans. Work, work is hard. Um, You're not very good at loving your wife. Um, You don't really like your spouse sometimes. Uh, You don't want to go to work tomorrow. Um, Your wife has cancer. Your husband has cancer. We're we're going to die, right? Um, Let me just read for you, and I'll close with this, uh, a paraphrase of Romans chapter a, just a little piece that, ad- that addresses this in light of the resurrection. And just, just hear this. This is, I mean, most of the letters would have been heard originally, uh, not read by most people. 
The suffering that you're experiencing in this present age is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in you. Both the creation and we were all subjected to futility and pain and we still groan every day inwardly while we wait in this earth. But Paul says we have the first fruit of the Spirit, the first resurrection. And so we will be adopted as sons and daughters, and our bodies will be restored. Uh, Take that with hope, as hope. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would make the resurrection our hope, our hope to live, our hope to get through the day. Uh, And also our hope to know that we are accepted, justified, not by our worth or merit, but by this event in history. And so we thank you for the gift it is to be uh, redeemed by a resurrection. We we ask for belief for those who don't, and we ask for for, um, a greater level of belief for those of us that do. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.